Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am here with another conversation episode. I don't know why I announce it like that every time. It's like, I don't know what else to say. Before we start today's episode, I have something quick and exciting to share with you. James T. Washburn is a Seattle-based trans storyteller and activist, and he has written a work called, well, Achilles and Patroclus, thus why I am sharing it all with you today. Achilles and Patroclus, along with several other 20-minute chamber operas from the Jane Lang Davis Creation Lab, will all be available to stream online from the Seattle Opera after September 10th. Achilles and Patroclus is an intimate retelling of Achilles and Patroclus' relationship from childhood to the events of the Iliad. It explores the non-linear nature of relationships and how we remember them while dealing with themes of fate and choice, the intersections of loyalty, grief, and sacrifice, and how idealism and perspective change from youth to young adulthood. The piece is a series of moments from throughout their lives, but reorganized by theme rather than linear time, much as you might remember a relationship in retrospect. The composer is Erica Meyer, and James shares that another one of the pieces that's being streamed in this series is a non-binary retelling of Icarus. So it just sounds like there's some incredible stuff coming from the Seattle Opera in September. Visit seattleopera.org for more information. James reached out to me on Twitter, and I was just really excited to share all of this with you. So to be clear, this was not an ad. It's just a really exciting thing that I wanted to share with you before today's episode. And speaking of, so today I'm very excited to give you more classical reception on the stage. That's right. I got this announcement and I've got this conversation. Today's conversation was with Danielle LaRose, who has been on the show before. She came on last year in the midst of the pandemic, where we had an absolutely wild and very difficult to edit conversation about Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida and how it relates to Troy and the Trojan War. And that was so fascinating. This time we had a much more toned down, much less frantic conversation. And this time, about the Amazons, but not just about the Amazons, about an all new retelling of the Amazons story that Danielle has written. She is an actress and a playwright and has now written a a brand new full length play about the Amazons and the Amazonomachy. Honestly, uh, I'm completely blown away by that. And it was so interesting to have her tell me all about it. So we talked about the Amazons in general, them as characters and a bit about their story, but primarily about Danielle's take on them and why she did it, what her company is all about, and, and just generally the play itself, which I, for one, cannot wait until it is being staged and I can watch it in person because it sounds incredible. I mean, it's the Amazon. So Lord knows I would watch it, but like, it really sounds so good and interesting and cool. Um, The the play will feature and and her company features exclusively women and non-binary people. And it's just really all about giving voices to the people who aren't, you know, the cis white men, which is just great. Danielle is also Canadian, so it's really cool for me too, having that kind of connection. I so rarely get to talk to Canadians on the show, Um, and so it was just generally really exciting. We get along really well, so it was a very casual conversation, very friendly, very much just, you know, two women chatting about such an interesting and cool topic, so I'm thrilled to have you listen to it. An update on the play, because we did record this back in like May, I think. Um, it's moving along. They did do a reading of it uh, in Edmonton, where the where they're all based. I wish I could have seen it, um, but it is officially called the Amazonomachy. We joke a bit about what the title will be, but it is now officially the Amazonomachy. And I take a little bit of credit for that. You'll see why in the episode. 
If you're interested in a little more backstory on the myths of the Amazons that we're talking about, you can refer back to the episode that I did on them um, back in March of this year for International Women's Month. That was a great episode that covers all of these myths, basically, that that are going to come up in this conversation. Conversations, writing the new Amazonomachy with Danielle LaRose. Amazons. Amazons. Yes. So thank you, Danielle, for talking to me again. Um, joining back after like this has to have been like a year since we last talked about what did we talk about oh Troilus and Cressida Lord yeah. this is about how my brain goes <laughs> like <laughs> hey was it was <laughs> it was a year ago and I think because we were both just getting into the pandemic groove I think we were probably talking for like four hours yeah it was you you <laughs> You were around great. the same time that I started talking to the Women of Ancient History fangirl too. that podcast. Oh, man, I love them. Uh, they're the best. And we also talked for like an abs- our, the, one of the first times we recorded together. We talked for eight hours. Wow. But yeah, so I think that's like that was that time of the pandemic, you know, it was mm-hmm. like, oh, my Back God. Back when we were people? all learning how this new socializing <laughs> was going to happen and it was before yeah. that awkward time when we forgot how to socialize. Yes. Which happened, which def- definitely happened. It's still happening. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you and I are back talking today because you've been working with the Amazons. And first, I, I guess, tell us again about your theater company and everything about that. And then we'll dive right into why the Amazons. Absolutely. So um, I started acting ages ago it's been you know a a full lifetime maybe maybe five or six lifetimes uh performing in classical theater um and just always being a little bit miffed that I was always playing the princesses and the women who have to live their trauma on stage in front of an audience because that always asks actors to do the same thing right um so it's a bit of a a bit of a toxic situation for lots of female-bodied actors so I started this company called the Tiger's Hearts Collective Collective, and we are an all women um, classical theater company that tries to reclaim uh, space for women and non uh, gender non conforming folks, non binary folks in the kind of classical tradition. And sometimes that includes doing Shakespeare plays um, and plays that people are more familiar with. Sometimes that means um, exploring Greek tragedy you know stuff that isn't early modern um and now we're venturing into the realms of writing our own classical material because they're just yeah we just want to be able to sink our teeth into material that's written by women for women and when i say women i mean like cisgender and transgender womb bearing women and non-womb bearing women anybody who identifies in that way should feel included in those stories that's yeah that's so exciting i mean as somebody who comes at mythology in general with that same kind of complaint um like I can't imagine actually being so into it as like acting and and having to be in those parts yourself so I can only imagine it would just be like incredibly frustrating and hard and unnecessary so I mean I I love it don't get me wrong of of course I love I got to play Clytemnestra last uh, well I suppose it was two years ago now because it was just before (laughs) we spoke. Um, But, you know, living in that epic skin is so exciting. Um, But, you know, we want to be able to take it further and we want to be able to see a huge myriad of of, uh, human and uh, feminine experience reflected in, in those characters. So while I love playing murderous, wronged women, (laughs) <laughs> it, you know sometimes you need a little bit of a break with somebody who's who's a badass amazon matriarch yeah so you today we're talking about the amazons because you wrote a play about the amazons and i mean basically i just want to hear all about that and all about the amazons everything you learned everything amazons 
I love the Amazons. I've always loved the them. And they're just so amazing. Even just their names are so oh, I know. evocative. And it just makes you want to be in the club <laughs> of, of those Amazons, you know? And I think I was, I was probably in elementary school when I first, you know, watched Xena Warrior Princess with my dad. <laughs> and I just thought they were so cool. Um, and then I was in my first Shakespeare play when I was maybe like, 11 or 12 and it was a midsummer night's dream and hippolyta of course mm -hmm. amazon badass queen is in a midsummer night's dream and i was so excited to see her and then she stood on stage for the first scene basically silent for like 25 minutes while theseus <sighs> head shake eye roll <laughs> you know, all of those things, stands on there and talks with a bunch of guys about how they're going to kill this young woman, Hermia, because she loves the wrong guy. And Hippolyta has to just stand there seething, obviously. She, why wouldn't she be? And I was so disappointed by this, this male gaze lens that was cast on one of my absolute heroines. And I never really got over that because I've had to... Midsummer Night's Dream is like one of the most popular plays ever let alone in early modern uh drama or shakespeare everybody knows that play everybody loves that play everybody skates over the fact that hippolyta is completely wronged and <laughs> she probably does not want to be there um but i've had to play that part so many times and standing on stage, being silent while that is going on around you, and there's an audience out in front of you who are complicit in that is, like, it breaks your heart a little bit. Because you see those little girls in the front row and you go, I could, if I didn't have to stick to the script, I could just go, no, this is bullshit. Come on, Hermia, we're going to go back to Themyscira and have a great life. And the girls in the in the audience would be like, yeah, this, uh, this is the play I want to see. But we're told that this is a love story and Hippolyta and Theseus love each other and it's yeah. Just, no. I, I'm not going to lie. So I – like I've definitely seen Midsummer Night's Dream performed a number of times. Like mm -hmm. I, I've de I've seen a lot of Shakespeare in my life. And I – and and I should add one of my all-time favorite movies. And I did mention this to you, but I don't think you've seen it or I, – I, feel like you'd appreciate it though is the 1999 or 2000 movie get over it which is both yes us, we did like, have this conversation <laughs> oh yeah because i will bring it up because yeah. that's all i think about when i think of midsummer night's dream because not only do the characters perform a midsummer night's dream as a musical in the movie Okay, but the so. movie itself is a retelling in that way where they clearly were like attempting a taming of the shrew 10 things I hate about you moment. Yeah, yeah. And definitely didn't get the depth of 10 things, but did get the entertainment. So maybe it actually fits because Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy. But is it more akin to like She's the Man Twelfth Night adaptation where it's <laughs> where it's mostly comedy, like 90s kids, Nickelodeon kind of focus? Yes, yeah. definitely. But it's like, many years well a f at least a few years a number of years before she's the man so it's much more in the realm of of 10 things and bring it on and like yeah. that kind of world right. and also has kirsten dunst because it was the year 2000 <laughs> and everything had kirsten everything dunst. Had kirsten and dunst. everything <laughs> should i'm not i'm not talking <laughs> against it <laughs> but yeah so i saw i saw hippolyta and i i heard this part and i was like this is crap she would never do this she really wouldn't let's just to say like no. theseus abducted her and also she was a fucking amazon like get out of here yeah yeah and like the text is just it's just crap it's just full of lies just flagrant lies like she always calls him my loving lord and all this bullshit i blocked all of this out i can't yeah. believe it like that's what i was starting to say before i got worked up and how much i love get over it and then <laughs> forgot hey valid um, totally valid i just it's best but it's like like i really have seen this so many times and i have somehow made no connection to the greek mythology in it it's mm -hmm. like i forget that it's also greek mythology and probably because it's so absurd to suggest anything good about Theseus, let alone Hippolyta like that. 
I did see one um, a few summers ago in London where they wheeled her on. It was at the bridge. Um, they wheeled her on in a box, like a big glass box. And she was wearing this awful gray smock and this like little cap. So she was obviously a captive. She was mm. obviously not happy about it. And it was the, oh God, what's her name? Um, the actor who plays Brienne of Tarth in Game of Thrones. Gwendolyn Christie. Yeah. Yeah, so she was just that's you know, amazing. This big, tall, gorgeous Amazon standing in a box watching this scene happen. But of course, it gets to the end of the play, and you have to reconcile them, and they have to be happy because we're not, we don't want to watch a Midsummer Night's Dream where everybody's not in love and so happy. And yeah, that's disappointing because that's very cool to begin. The initial at least image like that. was really cool. Yeah, yeah, especially with her. I mean, who else is an Amazon? Right. Casting yeah. dream. Well, that's, yeah, that's so interesting. And so, yeah, so, I mean, that all, I mean, like, through however many ways led you to write your own play about the Amazons? Yeah, I mean, I knew that Hippolyta wasn't the only kick-ass Amazon. I wanted to, I wanted to get all the other ones in there. Yeah, I basically, I I was so fed up with the extant material that we had um in in theater for for women and for amazons um so i wanted to recreate the intersectional matriarchy of my childhood fantasies and just have all of these badass women just living their lives they're you know self-governing and moving around and hunting and being self-sufficient and um just doing it in a in a classical world because that's where i live that's where i work that's how my mind is and and yeah, it's a, it is a bit of a you know two fingers up to to the patriarchy who has ruled the classical school for so so long. Um, so it's really exciting to just allow them to breathe and take up space. And we've got so many of them. We've got Melanie is in there, um, and Penthesilea, and Phoebe is there being a you know, really cool young Amazon. There's a really mm. nice kind of generational spread. We've got Atrera is there in like spirit form, watching over everybody, making sure that that it's all going to plan and kind of talking to us, the audience. So we get to we get to expand on this very exciting society. Yeah. And just yeah, like I said, live in the club. Be Yeah. And let them take up space. That was the perfect that's like such a perfect way to phrase it because it's so interesting with the Amazons because they were so important to the Athenian like mythology. Yeah. And they were depicted everywhere. I learned in covering them just briefly that they're only next to Heracles in the character or like concept most depicted in Greek pottery that mm -hmm. we know of, which is mm -hmm. fascinating, but there's no real or like thorough extant stories about them which yeah. is so yeah interesting and and yet they're that everywhere. It so much open exactly they're everywhere they're enormous and they're strong have... and everywhere it's not like they're everywhere you know languishing because they've been defeated no they're they're around and they're threatening and they're standing their ground and all of the like amphora that have amazons on them that are in there was one that that of course Amazon goddess Adrian Mayer talks about in her book mm. um, where on the one side they're fighting right and they're all like geared up and on the other side they're just hanging out bathing and doing their thing like they they exist in a, a non um, binary kind of female space where you can be a warrior and you can also be feminine and I think it was so confusing and alluring and probably very you know, heartening for the women who were who were living in that society to have an amphora with Amazons on it and go, okay, I can do this. I can get through this day. I often wonder whether it would have been like heartening, reassuring in that way, or more like jealousy inducing. Mm -hmm. I think it certainly mm -hmm. would have been for a lot of women. Like I'm sure a lot just accepted their lot their lot in life, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that living in that world to just be like this is what it is so I'm going to you know appreciate it for what it is or whatever but I definitely think there there had to have been you know Athenian women who of all places were particularly confined 
to yeah. the home and particularly like property of the men to be looking at the Amazons painted all over all the walls of the city and depicted on the Parthenon itself and on like every amphora on every street corner and then just think like, why the fuck can't I have that? You know, mm-hmm. or like, I'm just going to run off to the mascara and, you know, live yeah. with them instead. Absolutely. I mean, I kind of like to think that I've, I've got like a little running fantasy in my head that when they were growing up as girls and if they had to go through that um, Arctea ritual where they all pretended to be bears um, belonging to Artemis in like the in the sanctuary, there was a I can't remember which sanctuary it was. But yeah, they, they go through basically uh, a, a rite of passage as young women where they go up into the hills and pretend to be little bear cubs and run around and are just like wild and free. Um, kind of living out their Atalanta fantasies and pretending that Artemis is like their bear mom. I love that. And then they have to sacrifice their little um, Amazon wooden dolls because we've got these dolls that come down to us Mm. um, from the archaeology and they have to offer them up on the altar to Artemis saying, I can't give you my maidenhood. I've got to go and get married now, but here's my doll. And it's so sad. And like, there's this quote about having to kill the Amazon in the girl. And that's what this rite was about, was, you know, mm. getting getting that all out of their system so that they can go and be married and never think about it again. Um, but I like to think that women, you know, maybe passed each other gifts or gave each other the little perfume pots or something with Amazons on them and, and you know, kind of as a an act of solidarity to say this used to be us and it could be us again mm-hmm. in another lifetime because what That's... what else do you what else can you do to get through a day when when your life is you know locked in a windowless gynecium at the center center of a room just getting pregnant all day every day <laughs> <laughs> i just looked it up and it look it's the cult of Artemis at Browron. At Browron, okay. Brow, which um is Attic, so it is in Attica. Okay, so it's not that far away. Not, no, I'm surprised it's that close to Athens, but it does. Like I'm just really quickly scrolling the Wikipedia without looking into it too deeply right now, but now I want to. Um, oh, it's so cool. But it says it or- originates with the story of Iphigenia, which makes sense because Aulis is generally in that area as well. And, you know, the idea in some of the myths, some of the plays where she's like whisked off instead mm-hmm. of fully killed. And then that would that would make sense for the origin of that kind of from that idea of, of Iphigenia being sacrificed, but not being sacrificed and, you know, being allowed to live, but being whisked away to Artemis instead of of dying there which is really interesting and then to connect it to to women in general i want to i want so much to to learn more about those little the real life aspects of things like that the things that that women did in their in their real lives um i just never know where to start but this talking to people like you helps between you and then (laughs) i don't know if you've listened to my episode with um with Dr. Ellie Mack and Roberts, but she talked a lot oh. about Persephone cults. Oh my God, that like yeah. changed my whole life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you just hear my voice drop there? Because I was just like, oh yes, that was so good. <laughs> but yeah, just those little things of like real lives and, and the things that women did to make themselves feel better or, you know, because they already felt good or whatever it might have been. Mm-hmm. Just like. Because it's not that different to what we do, right? We're we're in a pandemic situation. We're locked in our houses. We are reading books. We're watching, you know, Netflix. We're listening to podcasts and stories. We're we're engaging in that escapism, that thing that we're not allowed to do right now. We're doing it through, you know, imagination and connecting in different ways. So they can't have they can't have been that far removed from us. So as to never be able to live out their hopes and dreams in their in their minds. So I like to Mm -hmm. I like to give them that (laughs) from my benevolent future spot. (laughs) And hey, I can write it into a play. That's fun. Yeah.
I often find, and I, this is something I'm like actively trying to let go of, that I'm too hooked on sourcing mm. to to like be able to to like have my own kind of imaginative moments with with real life women of the, of the that world or or even just of mythology in general. I've I went from like barely sourcing this podcast to like being so obsessive about it that I find I can't get past the sourcing on it and then Mm -hmm. I want to be able to have more fun with it yeah I I definitely I definitely experienced that writing this play as well because the stories that we do have I wanted to to have enough there for people to glom onto and say oh I recognize that story or I I kind of I kind of you know I'm, I'm aware of the belt (laughs) <laughs> and I'm aware of um, Penthesilea and and Achilles, but those two encounters are so far removed in the mythology that we have. And there's so much that potentially happens in the middle um, that I, I I really had a hard time reconciling what my timeline should be. And I was like, we start with Melanope is in the camp of Theseus. She's been abducted because she's trying to figure out where they're keeping Antiope. The whole, the whole battle has already happened. They've already taken Hippolyta's belt, um, and we never get Antiope back. She ends up going to going to Athens with Theseus, of course. But I also wanted to have this moment with Penthesilea and Achilles, and Penthesilea kind of growing into her name as grief of the people, and having that that huge epic story. Um, but then I was like, do I have to include the whole battle at Athens where they go back to Athens and they have their war there? And I don't think I can fit that. So I definitely had to, I struggled against that for a long time because like you, I wanted it to be accurate as possible <laughs> and not to, you know, throw shade on the wonderful work that that classes it's do to, to follow these stories. But at the end of the day, I had to go. The story we have to under we have to know the story that we're in, right? Mm-hmm. And this is this is the story that we're able to tell and that we want to tell. Sure, there's a huge huge time gap that doesn't make sense between fighting Theseus in the beginning and fighting Achilles at the end, but it's myth. It's alive. Mm-hmm. We can do whatever we want with it. And if we're reclaiming the classics, then that's exactly what I should do. Well, that's completely true. And the thing about the Amazons is I think they're so ripe for that. They're so ready for it because all of their stories were told to revolve around other stories. Mm -hmm. We don't have, it's not like we have Amazonian stories because they weren't even Greek. Um, So, you know, instead it's like the stories of Theseus and the Amazons were told to make the Athenians feel as though they were strong enough to have withheld an onslaught by the Amazons. They were told by the Athenians to to heighten their their like military prowess mythologically. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, well, the story of Penthesilea and Achilles was told to mark the importance of Achilles in I think it's primarily in the fall of Troy, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um yeah, and, so uh, Quintus Smyrnaeus. Quintus Smyrnaeus, yeah, yeah, which, and then of course he was rewriting kind of or retelling something that that is lost, but at the same time it was still told in that sort of like epic cycle of just talking about the the height of the Trojan War and and everything that came along with that. So that was told to just kind of be a part of that. It wasn't necessarily to hype anyone up, which is what I do like about the Homeric epics. They weren't propaganda in the way that like Athenian mythology was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Quintus did, he was super fucking extra. <laughs> oh yeah. He, well, and he was writing in, you know, in Roman period. It's just that he, ha- at least he had, he was working off of something that we don't have, which is what makes yeah. his work interesting. And also like, who knows what he made up and who knows just, yeah. Right. Question mark. Right. It's not that story of my life is just like constantly that like the, I swear the past, like year, maybe six months to a year of this podcast has just been varied levels of me going, but what do we not have? Mm-hmm. Like, what? Hmm, like, what is it that somebody might have made up and that we, you know, we take as mythological so called fact just because that's the only version we have? But who the fuck knows what was told long before that? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So could go on about that bit forever. But I think that the Amazons really are so perfect for that because it's like you get to tell their story from them 
versus yeah. the way they revolve around so many other stories and yeah i mean all the, like heracles is the last one i guess and that was again just to make heracles seem impressive yeah yeah and the fact that they always live on the borders of the greek reach into so-called barbarian territory you know how they're used as a, a geographical marker to mm -hmm. kind of draw a line in the sand as to how far um greek uh or Hellenic control uh, extends, but also as like a, a, a social marker to say, as an us versus them marker saying, this is what we are because we're in relief to this thing that we definitely are not, which are, I would def I would far prefer to be on the Amazonian side, like free nomadic culture where you're just roaming around and and living off the land and being badass warrior women no that's so true they are just sort of this yeah like borderland kind of pontus and themiscira and mm -hmm. which is a colonial edge. story as well like you were talking about with mm. nikita gill last or what was for me last week <laughs> but <laughs> You know, that colonial story is so familiar to us Canadians where you've got an other who are um, uneducated uh, and have primitive ways of being in the eyes of the colonizer and they need to be changed or confronted um, or villainized. So I definitely, I definitely want to make sure that this play for Canadian audiences um, draws attention to the fact that even though we've got some badass women on stage, some bad things happen to them and bad things continue to happen to women, especially indigenous women. If you're, if you've got a female body, you, you know, you've got a whole lot of hell coming your way, um, especially if you have an indigenous female body. So I want to make sure that the classics don't forget to bring it the other way we get so excited about going and living in that world and i absolutely am here for the escapism but i want to bring it back to us as well and say what hasn't changed in three thousand years yeah you know yeah that's so true i think it is so important in yeah in canada specifically to just always be reminding everyone of our colonial roots and the horror of the violence that still is perpetuated against indigenous mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. all of the time. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they feel like, you know, anybody, anybody watching the play feels like what, wherever they come from, whatever their background is, whatever their experience is, feels like, Hey, I could fit in with this intersectional society where I am free to be whoever I want to be. And it doesn't matter where I come from or what I look like or, you know, what body I've been given. I have a place with these people who, Ha who understand what loyalty and and community is like i always love that about hippolyta um when penthesilea spoilers when penthesilea mm -hmm. kills hippolyta accidentally when they're hunting together how the amazons don't we don't necessarily have this story of her going back and being like oh shit everyone's i'm gonna i'm gonna be hunted um by my own people for doing this awful thing um, instead they go with her to Troy, you know, they back her up and they say, well, you've got this, this warrior atonement that, that needs to happen. We're going to be there for you. Um, the Arenaways are going to, are going to find us. <laughs> That's going to be shitty, but you know, we're not going to persecute you for, for this accident, which I think speaks volumes of, of their community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, do you have Arenaways in your play? absolutely good gotta have a runaways i mean kindly ones they need to be there at all times mm -hmm. and i try and work in all of the names <laughs> furies runaways kindly ones they're all there kindly ones. humanities let's go straight mm -hmm. to the greek mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly because yeah. because um hippolytus is there as well and they yeah. have um have a very you know intimate relationship with with the humanities, obviously. They're just a kid. We've got some fabulous non-binary artists who are coming in and stepping into Hippolyta's shoes and just allowing that child to explore both sides of what they have. You know, they're Athenian, but they're also Amazon. And I don't want to take that away from them. 
I love that. They're really cool as well. It's it's definitely uh, potential spinoff material. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what is the performance situation for this? What's it called? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm I'm going back and forth actually on the name. Okay, I so it's wanted... not crazy that I didn't ask. <laughs> no, 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 it's not crazy at all. I wanted to call it the Amazonomachy because I just think that's a radical word, and also mm-hmm. we meet them in several battles. But then, then I was like, oh, is that going to be too unapproachable? For I, I, you know, you always have to think it's classical. But I don't want to scare people <laughs> with the name being too classical. I want it to be approachable because the story is approachable. You just have to market it as, you know, something that doesn't put you off right at the right at the get-go. So then I was like, oh, maybe we should go with something more um, familiar, like like the Amazoniad, if it's like the Iliad, or the, I don't know. I think I'm sticking with Amazonomachy for now. I would like to support that publicly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add it to the tally. I love Amazonomachy. It is such a good word. And it feels good to say. It does. I love it. Amazonomachy. Just... And it's badass because if you look at that word and you go, I don't know what that word is. I'm going to look it up or I'm going to look in the program notes or whatever. It's a battle with Amazons. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And it's so much better than le- like, because there's a lot of mechies <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know there's the titanomachy and then there's the centaromachy and amazonomachy just sounds so much better than both of those yeah yeah it's just yeah they're made they're made for it as long as the title makes you want to watch the play that's that's, that's my major that seems fair yeah <laughs> seems fair but yeah to go back to the earlier question before i realized i hadn't asked the title <laughs> of the play what is the performance plan we're probably looking at at fall time um, before we can get into rehearsals um, because it is a massive play. Mm. It is it is an epic in every sense of the word because I love That's epics, so exciting. obviously. Yeah. And being uh, being a classical theater person, I was never going to just write a play that was that had four characters. <laughs> so I think we have twenty three characters right now, some of whom are doubled. So, like Hippolytus, obviously, because they're a child, they're only in um, one or two scenes as Hippolytus, but they're in other scenes as a young Athenian boy who's worried about their older brother going to his manhood trials and trying to figure Mm. out what it means to live in this society that purports so much toxic masculinity. Um, And then we see them again, they come back as Cassandra. Mm. Which is really cool, and deliver this whole prophecy about Penthesilea and and Achilles and what's going to happen to them the next morning. So there are doublings, but it's going to be a huge cast. We're going to have to do a lot of um, like fight training and um, choreography that's going to be super cool because the weapons that the Amazons use are immense there are just so many of them from the war axes to the spears to the wicked shields there's a scene where phoebe is learning the parthian shot where you're riding on a horse as Mm. if retreating but then you turn around while you're still riding and you know deadly deadly shot going backwards off your horse there's going to be a big rehearsal process but hopefully we'll be able to get that started in the fall depending on on what openings are like Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I hope so. That sounds amazing. My God. I mean, epic right. anything is great, but Amazon? Scott, I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, we've got a designer who's working with us, um, mm. who is spectacular. Um, and she's looking at, you know, incorporating all of these physical elements of, of life a life lived on the land that would have would have hugely impacted the Amazons because we have all of these depictions of them on vases and on freezes where they're in battle. Um, and those things are influenced by the Greeks' other adversaries, obviously. Um, we don't necessarily have a clear picture of exactly what an Amazon looked like if an Amazon did exist, which I definitely am of the opinion that they did exist, just not in the way that the Greeks tell us they did. Mm-hmm. 
So we're like looking at the the climate of the steppe and the area of the Black Sea where they would have lived, what they would have had to have to hand to live on that land um, and to fight on that land. And so the design element as well as the, the fight choreo and just like the physical aspect of their existence is super empowering because mm-hmm. women are so often removed from the land. Um, we're not allowed to. And I'm... I'm Métis, so like my all of my ma- all of my male family members go out hunting all the time, and it's just there's a super patriarchal element where I was never let into that club, even if I expressed um, interest in it. So we're kind of you know kept at home. You you can have your little garden with its little rose, and that's as much land based living as as you're allowed to. You can go camping every once in a while. But but I'm like, no, give me the give me the thing to skin. I want to know these things. <laughs> I want to learn. I'll I'm... leave you to it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to have those skills that would allow me to, to live in the wild. So we're, you know, the Amazons definitely would have had those skills. Um, so it's a great opportunity to explore how that finds its way onto stage got these badass mm-hmm. skins that they wear and of course the pattern leggings and ooh yeah mm-hmm. tattoos we've got a whole tattoos, tattoo ceremony yeah. for Melanie Pay. she gets like a tattoo in the second scene that is kind of you know memorializing her heroism in trying to rescue Antiope it's really badass cool <laughs> I'm just like I'm just in on this <laughs> Well, that sounds, yeah, that sounds absolutely fascinating. I mean, yeah. Because <laughs> how different would your classical theater experience be if you had seen a play about, performed by all women or gender non-conforming artists? Mm-hmm. Um, in, no cis men. You know, <laughs> right? In, a, in an epic situation where the costumes were epic and the language was epic and the story was massively epic. Yeah, I mean, I honestly can't even imagine. Like, it just sounds, it sounds incredible. And I'm very excited that it will exist. And in Canada, that makes me very happy. And with the connection to, you know, the reminders of of the Indigenous people here, too, and the colonial aspects of all of that, I think is really important. Yeah, it's super important, especially because um, I have a lot of... uh, I have a lot of guilt being a classical artist and knowing that my bread and butter is something that oppresses people every day. You know, there are kids in school who look at the Romeo and Juliet text that they're studying and they go, I don't see myself in this. Actually, I see myself actively being oppressed in this. Um, And, you know, that's what I've built my career on. So as as an artist with Métis heritage, especially, I feel like, and that's something that I've only been able to really dig my teeth into um, during the pandemic, because when I was younger, I moved to Europe. You know, I lived in, I lived in at the heart of, of the empire and imperialistic (laughs) attitude. Um, And, you know, I was very, very much, my goals were all moving in that Eurocentric direction. Right. So I feel like I owe it to my community to turn those things around and say, no, you are welcome here. I have from my privilege that I definitely have. Um, I want to be able to create a space for you. And if if you want to come and play, you are more than welcome. This is for you. If you don't, that's fine, too. You know, I understand that this this stuff can be irreparably hurtful to to some people. But I hope that I hope that there's kind of an olive branch situation that's happening where where um, some people who haven't felt welcome in the classics before uh, will see themselves represented and there might be, you know, a tiny shift even for one or two audience members or artists who have had those traumatic experiences to go, no, I belong here and I deserve to tell these stories because myths are living things and they're only what we make them into. So... I'm really excited about one day when the theater is open, getting it out in front of people. And even if, even if it's just like, oh man, that fight was so cool. I want to learn how to wield a spear like that woman on stage. Because so often it's like, oh, well, there's a dude with a sword. That's great. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's certainly more than common. I do think, and classics is such an interesting field. And I think there's a lot of people doing really good work right now to open it up and make it less exclusionary and yeah, just the troubling nature of it. And even just opening up the way we phrase certain things of, you know, the study of the Mediterranean versus Greek and Roman, like as if they were the only Mm, people there. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like, that's just so absurd. Exactly. But I mean, that whole area, which is now Turkey and Iran and all of all of that area around the Black Sea, we've got so much really cool, you know, religions based on... um, earth mother goddesses and Uh and and female characters that do make their way into into greek mythology like medea um Uh who really kind of represent for that region and go no we're we're badasses and we're women that aren't necessarily uh contained within within the parameters that that are set by the greek world Mm-hmm. Silence of the Girls were, was my life during Charles and Cresta because I was just like, how do I reconcile all of the shitty things that are happening to this character? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's still really useful because like, at the very end of the play, um, obviously Penthesilea goes to Troy, right? Um, but we don't see her. We don't see her interacting necessarily with Priam um, and with the with the patriarchal structures at Troy. She has a council with Hecuba where Mm. Cassandra comes in. So her and Hecuba talk queen to queen and say, you know, our losses have been massive. Um, And you just coming through that gaze, like that, that whole bit of text from Quintus Myrnaeus about that. Is it to Siphone? Mm -hmm. Um, That's talking about watching the Amazons come in and saying, you know, women are not, are cast are not cast in diverse molds as men we breathe the same air we're made of the same stuff so i want to go and fight with this queen who's in front of me who's coming to fight for my city when she doesn't know us anything um so yeah she penthesilea comes in has this this very moving council with hecuba who will be played by the same actress who plays hippolyta who she's just killed mm. um so it's kind of this moment of finding her sister in another matriarchal figure in her life um, who needs something of her, desperately needs something. Um, And there's this kind of confluence between what the Amazons are suffering after having lost Antiope, after having lost Hippolyta, knowing that they're probably going to suffer severe casualties by participating in the Trojan War. But having the Trojan women also come to them like on their knees saying, we need you to be here for us so that we can have so that we can know that even if the doomsday does come and we are enslaved by the Greeks, that we have that image of you standing in confidence and solidarity with us to kind of carry you through, just like we were talking about with the Amphora. Um, and the images of Amazons on on vases to kind of help if you've got a neighbor woman who has just gotten married way too young and she's you know that she's going to be going through that that process as a as a young wife of you know just trying to produce a son no matter what um, probably in horrible circumstances going to your next door neighbor and going you know what you need this you need this mm-hmm. this Amazon decoration in your life to remind you that you've got you've got it in you to to persevere. Hmm. Yeah, that's I love that. That's really interesting having Hecuba there. Well, I mean, honestly, that sounds so completely fascinating. I'm thrilled thrilled that you've written a play about the Amazons and that they get like their voice in this way. And yeah, thank you for coming on to talk about it. It's yeah, so fun. Thank you for so having exciting. me. Thank I mean, you. I just want everyone to come and and sit in the in the Amazonian camp with me and learn how to do a Parthian shot and you know pass around the very strong wine that they're said to have drank and I have a good yeah time. I I mean I would fucking love to I um I wonder if you'll be able to to screen screen it at all or with whether it'll just be live I think this is probably going to be one where. 
we're not going to do, um, cause we did that, uh, zoom reading of Troilus and Cressida last year, mm-hmm. which was great, but I think this is one that you'll want to, you'll want to feel it in the room. You want to feel all those, you know, that feminine energy filling the space and all of those, mm-hmm. all of those bodies taking up, taking up room. Um, so we'll probably, if, if we manage to get it on stage with all the restrictions, um, we'll probably work towards doing a filmed version, but that my, my number one goal is to, is to bring it around with, with mm-hmm. actual people so you can come and share yeah. that space together. Cause I think yeah. it's important to have things where, I mean, it's not a play just for women <laughs> for sure. Um, but a place where people in communities can gather because, uh, because we've been so deprived of that. And I think this intersectional matriarchal society can be very healing, uh, bringing us together and, and just giving us a cool place to hang out in a cool world. Yeah, I agree. And and theater really is so meant to be live, you know, mm-hmm. to have those yeah, voices make- like I'm I'm a musician. So having those voices in the space is something that I really miss. Just sharing those vibrations. That's it's honestly also exciting. So I'm thrilled to have had you to come talk to all of us about it. And I'll have to I'll make sure to update my listeners um, whenever you have like a plan um, you know, if I can manage to force myself into Alberta, I would love no, to see it No, you don't. Live. Don't worry about so. it. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Don't worry about that. We'll come to BC. <laughs> uh, but I'm like, I'm like, I want to see it on like the first night because that just seems right. So. And who knows? We have, I mean, th- theater has changed so much. We've got most of our theaters here in Edmonton have, are all equipped with, Full film set, camera crews, boom mics, all that. There's a lot of kit to re- to record yeah. things. So who knows? Well, I hope all of the best because it sounds incredible and important. It'll be fun. And, yeah. y- you know, you were a big part of that because listening to your podcast and doing my gardening and doing my things and here and there and listening to all of the fabulous people that you speak to, um, you know, this is let's talk about myths babies like its own little amazonian matriarchy where everybody just comes and they speak their mind and they do their thing and they're just awesome about it it's just it's just in a podcast tent realm so good for you thank you (laughs) that's like one of the nicest things anybody's ever said about this show so i appreciate it i think it's really important really important and meaningful yeah yeah Nice to have you in our ears if you haven't heard that from any listeners lately. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. It's funny. I yeah, it it's just such a very bizarre space to exist in of mm. podcasting. Mm. Thank you again so much for doing this. Honestly, like it's just been so much fun and so interesting and I'm thrilled to hear about this play, which I will just assume is going to be called the Amazonomic You because that's the best. Name. I think now that that you've given it its stamp of approval, Liv, it's going to be called the Amazonomic You. <laughs> I would really appreciate that. I really would. It's the best. It's such a good word. I love it so much. It's so fun to say. Thank you, Danielle. This has been so good. Thanks, Liv. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening. I've put the link to Danielle's company, Tiger's Hearts, uh, in the episode's description, so you can check that out. And stay tuned, because as soon as we have updates on when this play will be staged, I will be letting you all know, because I will be eagerly looking forward to it myself. Thank you all so much. As always, it's it's truly wonderful to be able to do this and to have these conversations. And ah, I just love it. Thank you. I am Liv and I love this shit.